The following interview is conducted with Richard B. Gorgans, the Murray Holman George Professor of Applied Neuroscience in the School of Veterinary Medicine uh, for the Free University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, uh, May 5, 2010, in his office in, uh, in, uh, on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian, and also sitting in is his research assistant, Linhan Pan. Linjia. Linjia Pan. Thank you. Uh, we'll pick up. Tell us just a little bit anything further on the human trials that uh, when we were left off the last time. Okay. Well, there's several. Um, we're. I, th I don't think much has changed. Can you? Is that working? Yeah. Let's right go now? ahead. I don't think much has changed okay. since last time. If it'll but work. I'll, uh, right. I'll. I'll. I'll summarize. Uh, we're into uh, about a three or four weeks after our, our one of our first inventions, a drug. Um, it's international name. I, I don't know if I'm over restating some things, but it's okay. I'll do the it, best. It's fine. it's fine. I have uh, its international name. Its international proprietary name is Ampira. Uh, in the United States and Canada, it has another proprietary name called Famperdine. And we know it as foraminopyridine. It was our invention for um, spinal cord here. And it's finally been uh, commercialized by a corporation in New York for worldwide distribution for people with MS and will go to chronic spinal cord injury, likely as um, on the basis of uh, uh, off-label use. Uh, it turns out that, that spinal cord injury for people that have had it 5, 10, 15, 20 years and, if, and multiple sclerosis share some scientific issues that keep people from functioning or having movement. And uh, basically, I think that the company went for the, um, the gold ring to go after MS because the patient numbers are extraordinary. Uh, patient numbers uh, for spinal cord injury are, uh, in this country alone, about 250,000 chronic people. But when you start looking worldwide, and even new injuries are very small, there's only about uh, 11,000 spinal cord injured people every year in North America, um, at least in the United States, excuse me, I, I misspoke myself, in the United States. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, a lot of people ask, why MS first? A lot of it had to do with market and investment and being able to get something out. But uh, the truth is, it'll end up in the, uh, it'll end up being used as we first planned it for chronic spinal cord injury, and we're very proud of that. It's a Purdue intellectual property, and um, it um, it's out there. Uh, someone can get it by prescription now and be uh, um, work with a neurologist. Uh, it'll re it regains some functions, even um, walking ability, sometimes for people with advanced MS. So it's a really big, big deal. Nothing's happened since that, but nothing will happen except that. But it's thousands and thousands of people now, uh, in the in now and in the future, will have access to this drug. Uh, one thing I will add is that, like uh, penicillin or any first drug of its kind, and this is the first drug of its kind. This is not formenopyridine, our name, the actual name. <laughs> I hate this stuff. You know, uh, drug companies have a name, and they uh, they don't name it anything. Uh, it's confusing to even me. So, uh, excuse me, Catherine, I'm going to say 4-aminopyridine or 4-AP. That's the actual chemical name of the compound. Um, what's interesting about it is that um, it, it has a variety of uses, but mainly right now it'll be for paralyzed people. The interesting thing about that is, like any first drug of its kind, and this is the first drug that's ever restored function back to people with MS. There's other drugs for MS prolong the course of the progression of the disease but they don't really give people functional ability back, and ours does both. So it was even called in a, uh, an article, and if, if you want me, I can get you the citation, but in Lancet a year ago, it was referred to as a new era in the treatment of MS. So we're very proud of it, but it's the first drug of its kind. The, the real utility in the future will be the, the follow-up drugs like it. And also, all the ones that we dream of, we've already patented. So uh, Purdue has a vest big investment in this. They're not out there yet, but eventually they will be. Right. It'd be that's so that's that's the story on, on that that clinical use. There isn't anything to say except we're glad it's out now, right. and we did our job. Right, that's good. The second one was called oscillating field stimulation, and it hasn't changed. It's in a 
tug of war and in a fight with the FDA, which I talked about last time with you on, on camera even, uh, that has not changed yet. If the company that does, uh, does not either sue them or get aggressive with this, then likely Purdue may take that intellectual property back and will move it to another, uh, another investor or another company. Um, my own feeling is that uh, the company uh, is likely that has it now, and I won't use names, but uh, uh, that has it now is not going to be aggressive enough uh, to get this commercialized because they don't want to um, uh, poison the well for themselves in the future with a device panel because they're a device company and they're not a big one. A huge device company like, uh, like Medtronics would roll over these people. But a little company depends upon their approving their things and they're, not, they're just not going to be uh, aggressive enough for us. So it, it has already been used in people. It's been very successfully used in people. We've added patients to it. Um, I think there's a total of 18 people right now worldwide that have been treated. We've done some in, in, even in Barcelona. Uh, and everything that you could want to know about it is already before the FDA, and they're at the final stage of giving us a special number at which then we can go commercial with it, and they, they're not doing it. Right. And, and uh, uh, it's aggravating. And finally, the one that I talked about called polyethylene glycol, mm -hmm. that I have said this now for several months, but um, because it's not out there in the public domain, but the company that is handling that is moving very swiftly toward the first human trial of that. Uh, I know that because I've been contacted by some doctors who have already been asked to produce a clinical trial protocol for them and to submit them to a, an institutional review board. So if you're at Indiana University Medical Center and you have a protocol, you take it to first to your own university medical center for approval to do this on people. So when it gets to that stage, you're months away, and that's where it, that is. And finally, a replacement even for that or a backup drug, which we believe is better, is called Kytosin. This got a lot of attention worldwide here in the last couple of weeks. We even got on the front page of some newspapers in Pakistan, of all places. Uh, that was fun to look at that. Um, the, where this is right now, it's not anywhere near human trials, but it is uh, close to trials in um, paraplegic dogs within our vet school. We'll be moving on an IRB here to use this in dogs, which is for us the last step before we take it to, to humans. So um, we're, we're through the, the gauntlet in two, dr uh, in two, d two therapies uh, and close to human trials in, an, in a third and moving in with a yet another, which will probably be our easiest because we've learned a lot by, by doing these things over the years. And chitosan will probably be the easiest to get into human medicine for no other reason, one, than it's already used in human medicine and it's been approved before. What we're going to do is change what's called the embodiment, the way we distribute it, the way we handle it with people. But uh, as a drug, it's not unknown to be used in people. So we'll, we'll see this one. I, I'm going to guess within two years. Um, am I doing okay or am I too windy no, no, again? What about the nanoparticles? Uh, oh, that's going to be, yeah, the chitosan will be nanoparticles. Um, okay. there, is a, there is trouble in River City right now with, I'm sorry about that. I'll get closer here. Uh, there's trouble in River City uh, with um, the use of nanoparticles in medicine. Uh, everybody knows that the future of medicine in some way is going to involve nanotechnology, but very little of it's bridged into it. And part of it is because there's some suspicions that there's a downside to some of the nanoparticles. Uh, there's significant uh, uh, resistance now to using carbon nanofibers and other things that are similar because they have a, an asbestos uh, or a taconite type of action in, in producing maybe cancers and other kinds of problems. So th there is some real difficulty with nanoparticles in general actually moving into human clinical trials with people. Ours is not going to be a problem. And the reason why, and I may have done this last time with you, is that it's made out of a sugar and within a day or so it's degraded and gone. It's biodegradable. It's already going to do its mechanical effect on cells, which is to repair damaged ones. And then 
it will uh, be degraded by the body. And uh, since it's just going to be in the bloodstream for a, a couple days, and since it's going to be undetectable because we're going to be using nanoparticles themselves, we don't see a problem. Okay, sounds good. Um, and then, of course, the uh, we did, I think, talk the last time, I'm sure, just the December view of the distinguished professor, which is nice, the very home and professor of applied neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, but also, you're the, um, you have a joint appointment with the Weldon School. Yes. Can you make a comment on that? Okay. Uh, first, as a matter of record, I'm the Mary Holman George. It's a university named chair, right. okay. but I'm not a distinguished professor. Okay. Uh, that was bungled some time ago, and I won't say who bungled it, but actually when donors give as much money as Mrs. George do, did, the distinguished goes with it. But someone bungled my title, and I've gone through our new dean to change it, but I haven't yet succeeded. So I'm, I, I want to, for the record, state that I am the Mary Holman George Professor of a plane. Okay. Um, now, uh, that's about uh, 50 or 60 percent of my job in the School of Veterinary Medicine. The other is um, in biomedical engineering in the Weldon School. So I do hold two real appointments. I'm not a courtesy appointment in Weldon. I'm an actually a full professor there, and I participate in things like promotion committees and things like that. Yeah. I've got to go to the. Oh, okay, sure. Tell me when we're ready. Okay. Uh, going back to make a couple comments about my appointment in biomedical engineering. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy with that appointment, and I'm, I love working with Dr. Wadaka and some of the other engineers for real. Uh, my last uh, postdoc, I uh, uh, got her to join our group. Uh, she came from BME. Her her professor was um, uh, Albina. Ivanovich. I can never get her name exactly right. I apologize if you ever hear this, uh, uh, Albina. But uh, the other real I interesting thing is that I, it, it really is more in line with my, with my education. I'm not a veterinarian at all, and I've, uh, what, what little I know about animal medicine has come from working with neurologists and animal, small animal surgeons for 20 plus years here. But my own background is in biophysics, and um, and I have a lot more uh, intellectual home in biomedical engineering in some ways, including even the devices that we build. And then another interesting story is that when I was a student here in the early 70s, I had some support from the biomedical engineering uh, group. They, they, they provided support for my first year of graduate school. Uh, and then the next year, uh, Dr. Geddes came from Baylor University, and there's where you'll, and that's when Purdue decided to really turn, which was a focus group, a, a, a small center, into a real engineering center, and that was by bringing an uh, internationally known um, uh, person like Geddes with a tremendous record of achievement from Baylor into Purdue. Uh, so he came um, a year, year, a year, year and a half after I had been here myself, coming from Texas. And this is where the story gets remarkable, if not interesting. Um, Lionel Jaffe, my professor here, uh, wanted, given my background in Texas and my background here, which was in uh, biophysics and physiology, decided to invite Dr. Geddes as a brand new faculty member onto my graduate committee. So he did. So my, my, my graduate committee, uh, Dr. Geddes, was on it. I was probably one of the first graduate students, perhaps, that he joined a committee for when he came here. The, the story doesn't end there, though. I had finished a master's degree at North Texas State University. That's the old name. The university nowadays, they changed their name, is the University of North Texas. Don't ask me why they did such a thing, but uh, because I don't see any different in, in the cachet between the two. But uh, I was a master's graduate under a man at North Texas named um, David Redden, the late David Redden, now deceased. He did an awful lot for me, and he was my first graduate mentor. Now, David Redden, in his career, spent some time working uh, as a student under Leslie Geddes at Baylor. Baylor. So David Redden trained under Geddes. David Redden trained me, I came to Purdue, and ended up with David Redden's old mentor, Leslie Geddes, on my committee. Uh, and uh, over my career uh, at Yale, and just till a few years ago, I'd always kept up with Dr. Geddes. Um, 
uh, I know his wife well, and um, great loss to all of us. But you know, the funny thing about Leslie Geddes is um, he had so much influence on so many people positively at Purdue uh, from the time he came here that um, he's, you know, those these things about being immortal. Well, there is some truth to that. You're 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 never really ever forgotten, especially if you're a Leslie Geddes. I can only be. I could only wish that I could have as positive an impact on as many people as Gettys did. And I'm proud that not only is he sort of my scientific great-grandfather, but he's my grandfather too, so he's both, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Very kind. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave you. Leave. The next thing is awards and honors, and I'll let you highlight the ones that uh, you uh, like to do. I just told you a story about them cluttering up my house mm -hmm. uh, because I never have been a one to. I, 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 the first few medals that I ever got for anything, I was proud of. I was first when I was in my uh, early 40s, and I, I won a, the um, humanitarian award from the Spinal Cord Society of America, and they gave me a, a nice medal made a big deal about it and I was very proud of it and I had it hanging in my house for a while but eventually these things it, they just I would rather have uh, some original art by a southwestern artist or pictures of my grandfather in the silent movies with Tom Mix on the walls than a medal so these things have a way of finding their, their way into closets and the truth is I accumulated a lot over the last 25 years and when I redid my office uh, that's how it came out. Now, out what of those... One, one I'd yeah. like to ask, the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering, uh -huh. since we talked about biomedical a moment ago, could you tell us about that particular one? Which one? Though? Was the Weldon School, was there anything that you got from the Weldon School? Uh, maybe, I, I've kind of lost track. Well, um, maybe, there's a picture out there, I think, or something. probably something, but that's okay. You have to show it to me. Yeah. The ones that I kind of am, am most Good. proud of it, that that never should have been in a closet is the first one was the Humanitarian of the Year Award uh, for the work I'd done in spinal cord injury and serving on spinal cord panels and committees in support of injured families. And I, when I first got into spinal cord and brain injury work, I got drawn into that, but I liked it. It, it, it gave me a dimension. I, I once uh, flew down to give a talk to a, uh, a uh, a chapter in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I was invited by one of the one of the uh, neurologists at um, Good Samaritan down there, and I went down and gave a talk. And out of that talk, uh, they had arranged for me to meet several people that were injured, and one of them was a deputy sheriff that had been shot, and had a he was a quadriplegic and was. Um, in pretty bad shape and had only been in still in ICU after some weeks. That made a, a real impression on me and, and uh, I learned early that I couldn't be, I couldn't be go around and do the thing that you naturally want to do which is to paint a Pollyanna picture of the future. You just don't do that to these individuals. They've had catastrophic injuries and you just have to be straight with them about what's going to happen and what's in it for them, and oftentimes there's nothing in it for them in the clear future. Research just goes too slowly. I learned an awful lot about that, and I was rewarded with that medal for that work, and I, I uh, sort of prize that medal. Yeah, I would think so, because some of the quality and the work interacting with these people is so uh, it, necessary. I, I, you know, Catherine, I don't do that anymore. I did that for a long time, and after a while, I, I got to be where you have that part of your career that you spend a lot of time on and then as your group builds your attention shifts naturally there's there's about 30 people in our group now this is I don't have any extra time after I uh, it's a phases I, yeah and on top of that I mean I'm just going to go ahead and say it Linja that uh, you know out of all the 30 people here I spend probably 80 percent of my time taking care of you <laughs> she says thank you. That's of course a complete joke, and I only said that because she's here. She actually just could do very well without me, couldn't you? It probably gets bugs sometimes when I'm here and she's trying to work. Okay, uh, but anyway, the truth is there are other lynches in our group, young people that are building their careers, and uh, after a time, you're dedicated to the people at home. So I, I want to make it clear to you that I don't do any of that. I did it in my in my uh, in my forties and into my early fifties. In my mid fifties to now mid sixties, I don't do that anymore. Okay. But I'm a, I find that important work. It shaped a lot how I feel about uh, 
my career and what I think all of us, including Dr. Pond sitting here, have to give to others. The other, uh, I was, um, I won the Sagamore Award from Indiana, which uh, uh, since it's got Evan By's signature on it, I think it may be of value in a in a yard sale sometime, but I, no, I really, that was a bad joke. I'm sorry, Catherine, but I was proud of it. Uh, but I, I used well, to work... Did it come as a surprise to you? Yes, it did. Uh, it did. Uh, one of the th funny things, though, is that, you know, some people in Purdue are multiple winners of that. And uh, I used to work with uh, the, um, oh, I just blanked out on his last name, John. Um, he was the, uh, he's now retired so many years. He was the uh, Vice President for State Relations. Uh, John Huey. Right. And I think John Huey, when he worked in government and at Purdue, had accumulated four or five Sagamores over the years. So I, I don't I don't throw the Sagamore up. I'm glad to be amongst those that were thought of by our uh, by our state government. I like that award. And uh, but for those of you who don't, don't know, the Sagamore's an interesting award. I mean, there's um, uh, Hoagie Carmichael won it. I mean, there's some really interesting right. Sagamore and winners. There's, and there's no record kept of who, what's, who gets them. If you try to do that, they don't. And you can get more than one in each governor. With each governor, right, I know. It's, exactly it's, it's, it's interesting. And now, there are very... Very few. Yeah. I know. I'm, I'm proud of it. I made a bad joke a minute ago. Uh, very nice. I, um, I usually uh, don't count things that come from government or societies, uh, professional societies, uh, as I felt the, the spinal cord medal. Um, I also knew uh, uh, Marcus Singer when he was alive and was probably one of the foremost authorities in the world on tissue regeneration. He was a former head of anatomy at Harvard University. He spent his entire life doing that work. And uh, after he died, uh, within a few years, uh, they established a Marcus Singer Society. And they gave they give out a medal or two every few years to people for their research, and I'm proud of that because I got to know the man who the medal was named after. And then I was uh, later um, awarded the uh, as a um, distinguished alumnus from good old North Texas State University. Remember, it's now the University of North Texas, and I, I think I, have the, that on my list. I, I don't know why they went and picked me, but it was a very interesting night. I went down with my wife. All of my family in Texas went to this great, they make a big deal of it there. I think Purdue ought to do it, as good a job as, as North Texas does. It, there was a 400 or so guests seated at tables, a big, big deal. There were three of those given out that year. And uh, one of them was given to the movie star, um, Don. Ah, oh, geez, it shows you how much I like movies. He played the. He's he, he's a face that everybody knows. Uh, he played the uh, sheriff who was. Um, he played the private detective who was murdered in uh, Nick Nolte's uh, in that version of uh, Cape Fear. Uh, he's been in everything. Um, his name will come to me in a minute, or I'll call you back. But uh, we what's can add it into the it, it, It's really kind of funny. This guy was there sitting at the, at the table with my wife and I. Now, the way they seated us, I sat down. My wife sat next to him. And she talked to this bona fide, huge Hollywood star all night long who most of what he said was how nervous he was to get this thing because he didn't know what to say. And I just thought that's funny. Here's a guy whose whole career is getting up and reading his lines and making wonderful movies. He usually plays a heavy, uh, and uh, he plays a bad guy often. Um, and he always plays a tough guy, real tough guy. He's a big guy, and he always plays a tough guy. Uh, and here he was just basically almost coming close to shaking in his boots. Sandy said, God, you just can't believe how nervous he is. And uh, me, uh, I talk in front of people all the time. I, I've never been on camera, but I, I talk in front of large groups. So it was n nothing for me to say How five minutes. How did he minutes. do when he finally got up there? He did sort of okay. It was, he sputtered around a bit. He tried to wing it. You could tell that he tried to wing it. Um, but the audience enjoyed it. So oh yeah, of course. So the audience liked seeing his face, you know. Uh, I also went to school there with uh, Don Henley, actually, of the Eagles. Don Henley and I actually made some records together. and. Um, they awarded him that award a, a year or two later. I would have really have liked to have been there together with Don, who I've known for all of my life since I, he was 17 when he met me, and I a and helped him with his very first record with a group called Felicity. So I could have had a lot of fun sparring 
uh, with him on front of everybody, but what I ended up with is this movie star who didn't really want to be there and uh, d didn't, didn't know what to do. That uh, You know, one of the neat things about that is they videotaped it, and I had the complete videotape of the entire ceremony, and I, I looked at it once some years ago, and it really is true. He just didn't do a very good job at all, you know. <laughs> it just really... Uh, really kind of out of character. So I enjoyed that, but that both the, the getting the thing and that my old university 30, you know, I, I left, per, I left for, I, I, lo, I left New, uh, uh, North Texas State in about 1972 and came here. So after, and I was given that in the, in the early 90s or something. Yeah, right. and I do have that. On you got on the list and yeah, uh, right. I forgot right. the exact date, but I was, I, I, I was gratified that, that somebody remembered me. Um, I, I love the things I... 1994. 94. And, um, gosh, that doesn't seem that long ago when I got that. <laughs> uh, so, yes, there's a lot in there. Um, I have really enjoyed my, my working with the Intel Corporation. For a lot of years I served on their international science fair. Uh, that's not a big deal in there. Uh, you'll see all the things from it. But you know what? That turned out to be a big deal. Uh, the Intel Corporation, when they ran their international science fair and you're a selected judge, is a big deal. There were astronauts that were selected judges and things. And um, I remember it, 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 it really was, you know, they, they discontinued that program the way they used to have it, but for many years it was a really big deal. And the other thing that I loved about participating that, and they honored me with that, was that I really uh, got to meet some of the most, and got to see some of the most incredible young people. We're talking 14 years old. You just can't, all these people that are negative about the state of young kids from watching too many rap videos have never been to an Intel or any science international science, science fair. fair. Uh, the, the passion that some kids get when they're 13 or 14 for doing something uh, is, is unbelievable at what they can learn and what they drive themselves to do. Um, one of my favorite stories is the young man that won the, the math and physics competition that year was a person who had solved one of these ancient math riddles. You know, mathematics has got all these secret things that no one can ever solve. You know, I, I guess it's like finding the, uh, finding the root for the pi, you know, the holy grail of math. And there's several uh, <laughs> classical problems, and this kid solved one. But it turns out for having these famous people on the math physics panel, they found themselves unable to reach a conclusion whether he actually solved it or not, or whether he was actually even close to solving it or not. And so they brought in some Nobel Prize winner in math and physics to go through his solution. And it turns out he got it and he won the medal that year. Now, most people don't know how big a deal that was. In the oh. years that I worked with Intel, these kids got four years, got, most of them are in high school. They get four years of college to any college they want to go to. They get extra money on top of that. And they get to go and be a part and sit as, uh, as observers to the, uh, to the Nobel uh, Prize uh, uh, ceremony in, uh, in their area in Sweden. Yeah, they get to take them and their families as invitations until set that up, they get to go do that. Uh, I got to where uh, I just really get sick of all the bad press sometimes that we see about companies and young people now because I, my experience has been there's nothing better than America and there's nothing better than American young people when they really get a burning desire to knock the fences down and do something. It, I, it's incredible. And it's just incredible. Right. Uh, they're just wonderful. Um, I, I met a young girl who was 14 years old that solved a parasite riddle in the state of Florida that for years could not have, was not solved by either the, uh, the Department of uh, Wildlife and, um, and, uh, and, and working with government agencies for years. And this girl did it out of hard work and it's almost like police kind of uh, shoe leather, you know, talking to everybody that ever had a dog that ever happened, that was a mosquito-borne infection. And uh, my, my last story for you about that is I remember talking to her I was not on her panel, but some of the people said, Borgans, you got to go talk to this girl. She's just... So I go find her because she won that division. And I go find her, and she was still in front of her booth. And I walked up, and what I met was this really, really 14-year-old looking 14-year-old girl. Not the 14 going on 20, not the, not the Britney Spears wannabe, but a little kid with braces 
who was just just wonderful little kid still. Boy, did her parents do something right. And I said, I talked to her for a minute, and I said, you got to tell me what got you involved with this, this mosquito-borne thing, this disease, whatever. I forgot the details of it. And, she's, and this is exactly how she started out. She says, well, I had a dog, and his name was Fluffy. And Fluffy got sick. <laughs> I'm, I'm making that up a little bit, but that's almost verbatim the way she talked to me. I'm thinking, most kids will talk about their little dog Fluffy or their little dog Pudgy and him getting sick and going to a veterinarian. Not good enough for this young lady. This young lady wanted to know everything about it and found out that she that it was a, a still still a mystery. Fluffy did fine, treating it symptomatically. So she solved the riddle. And she goes from Florida as a part of the medicine contingent to the International Fair for Intel, and she won that division. A little bitty super kid with braces with, who mainly wanted to talk about her dog. Isn't that the something? It is. It's so very enriching. It's wonderful. It's, yeah. it's my, that's, if you want to know about the awards and stuff. No, that's fine. That's, that's fine, but behind each of those is some story that I've gotten out of it and 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 to end up on the final thing yes i'm glad they're there now because at my age when i talk to people like you and others come in they look at that oh what's that well, that's a picture of me and the gov you know the story behind that is he knew we were working on stroke and he died of stroke you know a few years after that we had actually come up with some things that we've been publishing on i i find some of these things really ironic right. and there's a story behind all of them and that's mainly why they're up there that's there mainly right. there should be main, uh, they're you know, not there for display there. but you have something that goes along with them yeah. all right um, I think we're coming down is there something that I forgot to ask or no. something you want to add to that you had to run off because I'm sorry for wasting 20 no, I'm no, going to no, say no, it on no, your no. tape I really apologize for wasting no, maybe I, 20 I, minutes I, we of your time most of it but I wanted to fill in on some of the other things that I know you talked a little bit about your special interests the oh, guitar I have too many special interests I uh, yeah, not really even really not even Lindsay Pond has heard me play guitar. You never heard me play guitar, have you? Yeah, I heard. Did heard. I sing with Sandy and play guitar yes, for yes. you? Oh, we did. <laughs> Most people haven't. Years ago, my wife and I still used to go around to various uh, uh, amateur open night, open sure. mic nights. But I'd had a real uh, a real profession once in my life, singing and playing and writing music. And and uh, what what is really interesting about that? Because that was all between the ages of 19 and and uh, when I. When I went into um, Fort Polk, Louisiana, military service, uh, 1968, that was all in my early 20s, not starting at 19. And the stuff we did back then has become known, believe it or not, as some kind of roots of Texas rock and blues, a kind of this fusion of rock and roll with blues and country music. And I never thought of us as a fusion of anything, except that I grew up uh, working on hot rods in my garage at my house with my friends on Friday night because we were all too scared to get dates. So what we really worked on was hot rods on Friday and Saturday, listening to Webb Pierce and Hank Snow on the radio, and then later on the Beatles, and all of that melded together somehow. And uh, many of those people have had fantastic careers after that. Many of them are more are actually still uh, out-of-work musicians having a hard time because they never found their mark but some of them found their mark early. I mentioned Don Henley the Eagles as one and Jimmy Vaughn. Uh, he's the older brother but actually the better guitarist of the two than, sure. than Stevie Ray Vaughn who anybody that was into modern music of the 90s know. He was killed. He made a lot of news by, by his untimely death. Stevie Ray Vaughn was doing a huge concert in Chicago, was coming to Indianapolis and his chopper, uh, I think a rented chopper or a plane went down in Lake Michigan. He, he died an early death. But um, I knew all those guys. Uh, I played on the same stages with almost all of them. Um, and out of that, it turns out that Texas has been a, a fusion point for a lot of what, what makes music of uh, today uh, in popular music. Uh, country rock particularly, and folk rock particularly. Those are old terms, but they're still around. That's right. That's and uh, Austin has become the Nashville of the Southwest now. Um, and so there's interest in all of us that in the 60s were Austin, Dallas, Denton, because well, most of us failed out of school because we were really musicians on the road, but we had to keep our army deferments. This was not during the days of the lottery. This was the days of the draft. So we had to stay in college. <coughs> so I bounced around a lot of colleges, and most of us long hairs, that's what I called us back then, ended up in Denton. 
They had a great music school. Denton has, has a fabulous North music Texas school. North Texas State. Absolutely. North Texas State has one of the most best, I mean, up there in the top five with Juilliard, North Texas has a fabulous music school. And we just liked the music scene in, in Denton, and we all ended up there. And uh, now there's these sites devoted to our band or p our bands and other bands like them. But I, there's more pictures and more history of my old band on the Internet now than there was. There, there's more interest in us now internationally than there was when, you were, when you I were was doing it at 20 years of age. And uh, most of our records, you can download them for free off of these sites. And um, when I go to the blogs and I read these hundreds, there's hundreds of these entries from people all around the world that are interested in the BRICS, spelled B-R-I-K-S in case anybody wants to Google it. But some of the sites are really excellent and do really good histories. And they had found pictures and things of us that I never even knew existed. And uh, It's amazing what surfaces. It, it is just amazing to me. I'm 64 and we're talking about something I did when I was 19, 20, 21. And, and it, it still generates enthusiasm for right. people. One of these sites is called uh, Garage Band Hangover. It, it's a typical kind of college kind of a thing that appeals to certain. But it's very professionally done. And I started finding out that almost all of my friends that I knew from back then, I could find them through that site and find out what happened to them. And many of them left the touring music scene and went and became very, very well-to-do but in studio music and studio musicians, writers, behind the scene people in Nashville. So I'm kind of, at the age of 64, um, Catherine, I'm kind of proud of my stuff. That's that right, I, I would think so. Dabbled around. The last story about that that's funny, and you ought to use this one, is I had a colleague here for many years named Andrew Blight. He is now a vice president of the company that is commercializing 4AP. And uh, Andy and I had worked together since the early 80s. I recruited him. I'm a little older than him. I recruited him here, literally into this building in uh, uh, about 1986, and he left uh, close to 96, uh, 10 years. He made, all, he made all of his career all the way through full professor here at Purdue in basic medical sciences, and he's a good friend of mine. And he knew a little bit. He'd actually met some of my friends. He, he went and stayed with uh, me one time in Denton when we were eating pizza with some buddies of mine that played rock and roll music back then. Uh, and so he kind of knew about this. Well, one day I was gone and a record came sent to, uh, this is in the no early 90s, it, it was uh, a new a release, two new releases from a record company in, in Texas called Texas Archives Music. And they'd redone one of our albums. And it came to the lab instead of to my home, and people have opened it because it was obviously a record, and I was gone. I don't remember where I was gone, but Andrew got it. And there was a nice brand new album cover with my picture, with long hair, with several of my friends, and it says the bricks and big letters across it, you know. So Andrew Xeroxed the cover and, uh, and then went around to all the floors over in Lynn Hall and pinned it to everything he could find, and he circled me in there and he put a question mark and said, who is this person? <laughs> He's playing, having fun a little at my expense. What had happened is generated all this interest again on campus about this stuff. So here's a lesson for all you young people to do something and then go into academics. Be careful what you do. It, it can actually follow you all of your life. And maybe beyond. And maybe beyond. <laughs> probably right. <laughs> probably right. I'll probably be dead and gone and somebody <laughs> will want to know something about the bricks. Isn't They'll that put the it on top the of the green stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. I didn't leave anything. I'm just telling you some interesting things that yeah. I like. My other hobbies are antique cars. I'd never had the money to have a lot of them. The most I've had is two or three at one time. I build them up until they're really nice and then I sell them to be able to buy a basket case of something else that I want more. So at, uh, right now I have two. Uh, unfortunately, these I will not sell because they're wonderful. But my, um, which you'll see over here, here pretty soon. I'm repainting a 1946 Ford that I have, business coupe. And I think I talked with you. I know that you like Studebakers. Mm -hmm. My first hot rod was a 1953 Studebaker, uh, and I have a '69 Corvette uh, side pipes, uh, the big muscle car of its of its age. Great looking vet. Um, one of the girls that lives with me has a, uh, a Jeep, and we customized it with big tires, and I'm repainting it for her, and uh, uh, she's a graduate student um, from China, actually. Uh, she's a little like Linja. Uh, Linja came here from the middle of Beijing, and the first place she gets 
is a place out in the woods. It was as far as you could get from an apartment in a big city, right, Linja? Yeah. And then the house that he and her, she and her husband just bought is even more acreage with a part of Wea Creek behind it, a lot of acreage around her house, woods and all of that. And the very first, the very first car that she went out and got was a uh, Mercedes hardtop convertible. Um, because they were super expensive in Beijing, she never dreamed that she would ever have one. I think I'm telling this right now. She, and when she got to America, she found out because of these import duties and all that she could actually get one here, and she did. So uh, Andrew was another person. He lived for seven years in New York, never even owned a car. The first time he ever got to uh, Purdue, he went out and he bought a house way out in the country and bought a, a, a big Jeep to go through the snow. Well, I have a young woman who lives with me named Wen Gao, and she'll be entering full graduate school at Purdue uh, soon. And uh, she's been taking classes here for some time. And she lives with my wife and I, and with another young lady who lives most of the time with us, also from China. Uh, Wynn always wanted a Jeep, a big Jeep. And I wonder why would someone, and I'll ask you this, uh, Lindsay is here, I don't know why a young girl who in her late, she uh, was 24 when I met her, but why the dream of a big Jeep with big knobby tires and like what we call mudders here, the, the kinds that really a boy's car. Uh, you'd see some of these on the campus. Jeep Jeep, right? A big Jeepy Jeep. Right. I mean, it makes the regular Jeeps look like Jeep's little brother, you know. And I, I just don't know where the seed in her head came from, from living in Beijing her entire life. Uh, and um, part of it is the movies, part of it's seeing things, but she knew about big Jeeps. So I finally found a couple Jeeps for her to look at, and I got one for her because we live in Delphi, and she has to have her own car to make her classes. So I took her, and they were both really nice, but one of them was a little dinged up and was really an outdoor Jeep. Both were used, and it had the big tires, and then there was a regular Jeep that I thought she was going to pick, and it was even in her favorite color, which was yellow, but it had the little tires. And uh, she went for the big one. She says, oh, I love these. This is, I did not know that this is in, this is, you." she didn't understand them, but that's what, that was the idea she had always had in her head, and I guess from the movies or something. This is what I want, right? But that's what she wanted. Now, if you own one of those things, you'll know you really can't drive them over 55. They're, the huge tires make them somewhat unstable. They're also big gas guzzlers. So I told her all of that, and she says, I'm not going anywhere but to classes anyway, and I don't, I'm not going to drive to Indianapolis unless you go with me. So she says, I want the big Jeep. So we bought the big Jeep. And... Um, that big Jeep is now another one of my projects that will go on forever. We're getting, uh, uh, I'm repainting it for her. We're putting on the doors that are uh, the bar doors so you're basically open air, you know, for the summer. And um, I have a love affair with cars and building things, which you've probably figured out. I like to make things still. Music, I have 27 guitars at home, four vintage fiddles, and three vintage banjos. All of them are vintage. Some of them, I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you how much they're worth. Uh, to me, they're just my age, and I bought some of them that were old back when I was a young man. I liked the sound of Dwayne Eddy and his guitar. That would be a name no one would know, but maybe you remember. I recognize The that. twang, doing, doing, and I got a Gretsch guitar. Well, that Gretsch guitar was eight or nine years old back then, was made in the 50s. And now those things are ten and fifteen and eighteen thousand dollars oh, yeah, a piece. Right. It's just incredible how much that stuff. So I don't talk about it. Uh, I'm going to make somebody really happy when I pass on one day, leaving some of my guitars to friends. I gave one of my guitars to Wade. Did you know that? I gave her a blue Gretsch solid body with blue sparkles on it. And it was too new for me. And she has a band that she plays with. We're talking about a Chinese girl next door that's just finishing her PhD here. And uh, I decided I'd give her an early going away present. So I, I, bought her, I gave her one of my old that's Gretsch's. Nice. And um, so I, I, I love the guitar. I love young people to play them. And um, I'm still involved with that. I collect militaria because of my family. has been a military family as far back forever. Um, I have a very large antique gun collection. But some of these things are not new, Catherine. I want to tell you it sounds like a lot. But the truth is that I've been doing these things since I was a teenager. Uh, my first cowboy guns from the Southwest came from my grandfather. And I bought, I could go into a, a store out, um, I did this in Nacogdoches, Texas. I went to a little store outside of Nacogdoches near Martinsville, Texas. My sister went to Stephen F. Austin College. 
and this was in the um, 60s. And I went into that store, and there were a couple really period, what are called Colt Lightnings. It was Colt's very first uh, double action revolver, one of the favorite guns of Jesse James. Uh, um, <clears throat> Interesting looking guns, uh, different than peacemakers, because I already had some of them. So there were two of them. One of them was nickel plated and one of them was blue, and they were beautiful. And I bought them for $35 a piece. Wow. Now, one of them was 41 long Colt, and the other was 38 long Colt, which they don't make anymore. And, I, and I, this old guy sold me both of those guns for $35 a piece. Wonderful. When I walked out the door, he said, By the way, sonny. Said you can't buy ammunition for him anymore. Ha ha ha. He thought he just put one over on me. You know, it is funny. So I've been doing this, Catherine, a long, long time, and I have a lot of interest and a lot of passions. And my other passions, my wife, uh, she's got passions like me for singing and music and quilting. She is a dyed-in-the-wool, almost professional level, go-to international quilting shows type of quilter, and so sewing is a big part of our house. And our latest one has been collecting Chinese art. Thank you, Linja, who you and Yao introduced me to my first bazaar in China, where you could look at these things, and in your hotel, they might, if it's a true watercolor, they charge you. Remember the one at the, the little gift shop at the uh, Garden yeah. View where you first met me? They were $400 American there. And then her husband took me, with you and your husband took me to a bazaar on a Saturday only open in the bowels of uh, Beijing somewhere uh, and we found those same things for 15, 20, 25 dollars yeah. and that's because nobody knows about these things sure, uh, right. um, Bojan even has a good story on me too she took me to an antique little row, one street of really old shops. They don't call them antique shops. Everything in China is antique. I mean, it, everything's old there. What you and I think old is not old in China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so she took me to a real place where there's some old stuff. And one of the things that they had uh, there, which is um, not supposed to be sold and not supposed to be looked into much, were the little tiny shoes, uh -huh. the golden oh, lotuses, uh -huh. about size three or something like that that are part of the ancient ritual which was stamped out by the Chinese government. And the, they started stamping it out right after the turn of the century. The foot shrinking, what do they call that, Lin Jie, help me. I forgot the name for it, when the foot binding. Um, the, up till World War I and II, uh, Chinese culture, it was considered a beautiful for a woman to have tiny feet, very tiny feet, smaller than you can so tiny that you couldn't hardly walk. There are stories of the women that had their foot bound that were not able to run out of buildings during uh, the bombings by the Japan, that they had to crawl out because they couldn't even run on their feet. And that begins at a tiny, very early stage when a, when a girl is a, uh, just a toddler. And, um, and they have special ways of binding the feet to do this. Well, China now is uh, pretty much embarrassed by this. There's only been one documentary on this but it got out to the West a few years ago through um, Canada, and it was a BBC correspondent who is Chinese that got in there and fooled everybody and did hidden camera stuff and met, talked to people and kind of unraveled because it is very, uh, now help me, Valencia, it's, it's, it, I don't know it's fair to say the government is embarrassed by the foot thing, but they don't like it. In China, there are things you just shouldn't talk about and you shouldn't involve non-Chinese in, and the foot binding thing is one such thing. You'll never see the true foot binding shoes for sale or pictures of the women whose feet were bound. And I went to one of these places with Bojan and I couldn't believe it. Some of that stuff was in there. But they were the real shoes. They actually had mud still in the thing. And I made the mistake of buying a nice looking pair. Oh. I, no, I, I, sh I should have got the ones that had been worn and were dirty because now after I've left, and I, I don't know when I'm going to get back to that place, uh -huh. they had, but what I did get was a picture taken at the turn of the century of two ladies with their feet bound. And um, you, to me, I don't know how to, why I'm telling you this story other than leave you with a, an impression of me is I'm crazy for history. I'm crazy for the oddball. I read, I read, I read, I read. And when I go to somewhere like China and I have friends like Linja, they don't even know what to do with me. I want to, I want everything. I want to know everything, you know.
And he know actually he knows more history of China than us. <laughs> I'm sure. It, I don't nice think that's true, Lydia. Your husband is a true scholar in Buddhist tradition and Buddhist history. I learned that from Ri and others who are native Mandarin speakers, and they say Yao is a tr it isn't just the art that Yao knows about. He does it himself, sure. but it, that's true, isn't it? Am I not? Yeah, he does. And I'm and you're just a very humble person. Uh, Chinese elites that have degrees like she does. You know how many people, what, what tiny percentage of anybody in China would ever rise to the kind of education Lin Jia has? You just, you meet someone special when you meet a Lin Jia. Right. Uh, Bo Jin Chin, who you may meet, she's someone special. She took the exam that students take early in their academic career. If they fail that exam, they don't get to go to a Western-style university, period. And she took another one, the equivalent of our GRE, and she maxed that, and she got stipend support and other things that you just don't get in China. And they waived her other tests. And, you know, that's such a tiny fraction of the young people in China, such a tiny fraction. And so I always felt that when I was around Linjia and some of the people there that are educated, the, the one thing I learned is you're special if you can pull that off. You were special in the drive you had to get yourself in and to end up parlaying your, your meetings with uh, Professor Zhu into having him take you as a student. He was a former president of Capital Medical University in Beijing, one of the most best in the country. And he was the president there 20 years. Now there's a downside to that, but as you get older you'll be proud of that. You'll be proud that that's where you came from and that a, a person as esteemed as he is would be there. But the other thing that I want to mention while I'm talking about this is I also uh, have been struck by the enormous humility of the best. China isn't that different than America. If you're, if you're um, many people, I wouldn't call them braggarts, it's in the culture to be humble, especially to guests. But there are people that still show their oats, especially younger faculty members and people. I met them in Xi'an and Chongqing and Nanking and all. But the ones who I think have been the most creative or the most dedicated or the most driven to succeed, the, it's almost that it's an inverse relationship with humility. And uh, Linja, she wouldn't tell us the stuff she knows. She, she prides herself in coming here. Uh, I've never heard her say that this person tried to do this for two years or more and even went to Scotland and they can't do it, but I can. Now, uh, an American who's vying for a prof uh, uh, assistant professorship would make certain their department chairman knew that. You know, they would make certain that they knew that. Uh, it's, 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 not, it's not built into yeah. them. It's certainly not Lindia. It's not any of the young ladies and young men that are here. Uh, it, and I like that part of their academic culture. Yeah, now, Linja tells me often that I'm, I'm, um, that I'm uh, overboard on thinking that the Chinese uh, are so great in so many things. I think that your view of your own country is it's got, and, and academia. I agree with her. There are some things about Chinese academia I really don't like at all. But it turns out it's usually tied back to population pressure. So uh, what you find out is some of the more draconian things that are done in Chinese universities are uh, usually, uh, in terms of the way students are treated, are because there's millions of kids trying to get in there, not tens of thousands, millions. And the professors that guide these students through their lives there are old school. But that's changed. Old school means that they treat the students, and I'm... Old style. The old style. For example, Linji was treated pretty much as a, uh, like an employee. <laughs> but that's changing because many of the younger professors who are now back in the medical schools and the best universities were trained in the West. Yeah. And their attitude is more like ours. So I've learned a lot. I'm not, I'm not got some kind of crazy attitude that's unwarranted about how wonderful China is. China's like any other place, but it's, uh, but it's a wonderful culture full of wonderful people whose cultural identity is to be giving, to be gracious, to treat guests very specially, very specially. Uh, you get off the plane in New York City and you get off the plane in Shanghai and I guarantee you there are two different worlds. I'm sure that's true. It is. And uh, yeah. I hope you get 
to have yeah, you. We get a chance to go. Sometimes. I hope you can because right. it's a wonderful, magic land. Right. But but don't go as a tour. Find some academic there or find someone to go with you that knows <laughs> something about the. Will do. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I got you. off on this. I want to thank you very much. Thank you, Linda, for sitting in. I really uh, oh, jeez. I want to not thank me because I'm too windy. I get off telling too many no, stories. I'm way too good. talkative. You're excellent. And I, the